Well, good morning and welcome to Ashburton Presbyterian Church. Sunday is a joyous day as God has set aside this day for rest in, from our daily toils and labours and to come before him in worship, giving thanks for the many blessings he has given us, repenting of our wrongdoings and also listening to his word so that we can grow and mature. So I am delighted to be able to join you here this morning, albeit online, and I hope that you are rested well despite the one hour less sleep last night. God has set apart this day, the Lord's Day, because he is set apart. He is holy and he is deserving to be praised. He is deserving to be worshipped. And he is not just deserving of this day to have to himself, but he deserves to be praised and worshipped every day. He deserves our life as a living sacrifice in worship to him. The way the world might see as being set apart might be along the lines of to have a certain quirkiness or having a particular set of skills that maybe other people don't have that might be a benefit to them. But God is holy because of his perfection. He is perfect in justice, he is perfect in power, and he is perfect in righteousness. And no one can compare or does compare to him. This is what the psalmist says about God in Psalm 99. He says, The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalted, exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. So before we declare his holiness in song, let us pray and commit this time to the Lord together. Holy are you, Father, the one who rules and reigns in perfect righteousness and justice. So often we are disappointed by the leaders we have on this earth, but perhaps that is because we forget just how sinful humanity is and therefore have this unrealistic expectation that our rulers and leaders will be holy and righteous. But we know that we have a king who sits on the throne full of majesty and goodness. For in his perfect obedience to you, he laid down his life on the cross so that the curse of sin and death will be no more. And so we wait for the day of his return when your victory will be exclaimed and this world will be under your perfect rule. And until then, we come to worship, for we know that you are reigning here and now, drawing your people to yourself. You are seeking the lost, you are caring for the poor, and you are saving the dying souls. And it it is in your name that we pray all these things. Amen. So please join us in singing a couple of songs. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then we'll be singing King of Kings after that.
It is now time to be opening up the Word of God here this morning. 
and Nam will be bringing us our first Bible reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Good morning. The Bible reading is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 16. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaching come to hypocritical liars whose conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them, order, and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Having have nothing to do with godless myths and old wife tales rather than train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value of all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in this manners. Set yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of God. Let's turn our attention to the New City Catechism as we have been working through one question per week to help us in our understanding and in our faith. We continue to learn about prayer this week as we look at question 40 and question 40 asks, what should we pray? And the answer to that question is, the whole word of God directs and inspires us in what we should pray including the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Ephesians 3 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Alistair Begg comments this. When we're asking what we should pray about, we instinctively turn to the Bible because it's the Bible that inspires us and directs us. So whether it's Jesus reminding us that we should always pray and not faint, or Paul reminding the Philippians not to be anxious about anything, but in everything to turn to God in prayer. It is the Bible that keeps us on track. As we pray, we're really asking God to bring our lives and the lives of others into line with his purposes. And when we pray in that way, we're able to pray with confidence. So we can pray for our world, that men and women might come to believe the gospel, 
We can pray for labourers to be sent into the harvest field, as Jesus said. We can pray for the work of the gospel in our own lives, that we might become holy and joyful and thankful. And when we do all of this, we need to remember that God is far more willing to bless us than we are even to take the time to ask him. As Jesus said, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We now return to the question and answer. And question 40 is, what should we pray? Please join with me in saying this answer together. The whole word of God directs and inspires us in what we should pray, including the prayer Jesus himself taught us. And let's say this prayer together. God who hears, let your living word shape our desires and our prayers. May it challenge us to pray for things that don't seem possible. May it inform our view of you as we approach you as beloved sons and daughters. May it drive us to our knees as we recognise our need of you. Amen. We're just going to change things up just a little bit today. Usually, as you would know, we have a time of confession now, but we will be doing that after singing our next song. Instead, we'll be praying for our offerings as we devote our lives and everything that he gives us to him. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you give us food to eat and clothes to wear. And so in all things and everything that we do, we give glory to you. We thank you for your provision and pray that you will help us to steward all the things you give us well, according to your purposes. And we give these offerings to you now in devotion, thanksgiving and repentance, knowing that our worth is not in what we own, but it is in Christ Jesus, the one who gave his life for us and bought us. And it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. So let's come and sing of this living hope of the resurrected Jesus, the one who reigns still now and who will return. Let's sing this song, Living Hope. Beautiful Savior, I'm your 
As we come to a time of prayer, let me just read from 1 Chronicles 16, where it says, Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Let's pray together for the world and the church. Dear Father, we stand before a king who is unmatched in his power and majesty. You rule and care for your people like none other. For your love brought your son to earth to die in our place, taking on the full penalty of our sin. Your love and wisdom are so wondrous that even us as Christians, you know, sometimes we have no words for it. And we even start throwing around words like reckless love because your wisdom just goes beyond all human wisdom and your mercy and grace is beyond all description. So we just stand in awe, Lord, of you. And we acknowledge that we fall short by some margin. It isn't a matter of one or two mistakes. We make little gods and idols and we worship them. We look to our good, forgetting that our relationship with you is already broken and there is nothing in our power and deeds that can make amends to the broken relationship with you. And so we thank you for Jesus and the forgiveness of sin. And it is because of that grace we are able to see how sinful we are and just how prone we are to wonder and find comfort, satisfaction and meaning in other things. And so now, Lord, we come before you now with our private prayers of confession of sin as you reveal it to us both the ones we are aware of and the secret ones that we might not be. And we come before you now in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have not only forgiven us, but you use us as your instrument for the gospel work on this land. And we pray as we continue to study the book of Acts that you will grow us and equip us, giving boldness and courage to proclaim your name so that more people will be one to you. 
We thank you for the ability to stream our worship online so that we would not miss a day of worship. We long for the day that we return together. And so pray that you'll give us wisdom as to when and how to gather again each Sunday. We also ask that you will lead the leaders in their planning, first for the immediate future, the setting up of the live stream and the gradual return to gathered worship, and also the plans for 2021 and ahead. We thank you that the Holy Spirit continues to work and lead us, and even when things could have gone pear-shaped, you have opened up doors that might not have otherwise been open. And so we pray we can be fruitful and faithful in our service to you. Help us to look both inward and outward. And we also pray that you will send those who are needing to hear the gospel and those who you are wanting us as a church to care for. We thank you for Life Explored and the class that we are running. And we pray that you will continue to encourage all those participating and learning to grow in their faith in you. We also pray for the Sunday school every Sunday afternoon. Please be with Suzanne as she leads the groups that you will also feed her in her devotions and in her teaching. And thank you for biblical truth being taught even at a young age. We pray that you will help the children engage every week, especially during the time that it is online. It has also been a very different and difficult year for those in school and university. And as time draws closer to exams, we pray that you will be with the students as they, also, they not only deal with the online learning, but also deal with all the changes that occur during this year. We pray that their learning will not be halted and that they will not be distracted over the next couple of months especially. Help them to endure, we pray, not only thinking about their scores and grades, but how you will use them with the learning and the knowledge gained during their studies. We also remember Daniel and Sharon Liu and their ministry in Thailand. We pray that the gospel work will continue to flourish in the outreach and the building up of leaders and workers. We also pray for their family as they work together to balance ministry and family time. And we pray for your strength and grace to be on them as they support one another. As we approach your word today, we pray that you will be with Barry as he speaks to us about your word. We thank you for his studying and ask that you will lead him to speak truth in love. Also, we pray that you'll prepare our hearts to hear your word and we pray for your nourishing of our souls as we listen to your word here this morning. And we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. And so now we come to the second passage, which is the passage of the sermon. And Theodore's going to be reading for us Acts chapter 20, starting from verse 13. Acts 20, 13 to 38. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletos. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem if possible, by the day of Pentecost. For Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, 
I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. Our desire is to be transformed by Christ and to walk in his way. And I hope and pray that that is your desire as well. If it is... Let's sing this next song together. May the mind of Christ as we come to a time of listening and learning from his word. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day.
His beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win and may they forget the channel sing only him sing only Let us pray as we come to God's word this morning and ask his help uh, to understand it and to bless it to us. Father, we thank you that your word is truth and life. Father, we pray that as we look at your word this morning, that knowing uh, our own hearts, knowing uh, where we are at, uh, knowing our circumstances, you would speak those words that we need to hear. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would enable us this morning to respond uh, in faith and in obedience and with hope to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Farewells are significant time stamps on our lives. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced them. Uh, they can often be sad times, uh, especially when a farewell is final. Uh, it was about 36 years ago that I got a call from a friend of my mum uh, asking me to, to hurry around. Uh, they thought my dad didn't have long to live. Uh, he had motor neuron disease. It had advanced very swiftly. Uh, he had wasted away over a short period of time. Uh, he had not been able to speak for some time and it was difficult to swallow. When I got there, he was lying on my old bed in my old room and breathing very shallowly. He was not conscious and he wouldn't regain consciousness. I sat on his bedside uh, next to him for an hour or so, I don't know how long, uh, wiping his brow with a moist face washer and finally he stopped breathing. It occurred to me as I sat beside him there that there was so much that I wanted to say to him and didn't have the opportunity uh, and then it was too late. Well, Paul wouldn't let an opportunity slip by to speak to the Ephesian elders. Paul knew in his spirit, whether it was a revelation from the Lord or he just had a sense of it, that this would be the last time that he saw them. This would be the last time that he spoke with them face to face. And, and so he told them as much. In Acts 20 and verse 25, we read this. And now behold, I know that none among you whom I have gone out about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. I wonder how they heard Paul's words. Perhaps they were a little numbed. Uh, perhaps uh, their hearts were heavy uh, as they tried to come to terms with the things that Paul was saying to them. No doubt they were deeply saddened uh, as his words sunk in. You see, Paul had only left them a, a number of months earlier uh, after he'd been their pastor for roughly three years, 
Uh, and this now was his final farewell. <clears throat> Paul didn't know exactly what lay ahead of him, uh, but he did know this. He says in verse 23, The Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. He's headed to Jerusalem with uh, the offering for the relief uh, of believers there in the midst of the famine. But knowing that something terrible lies ahead, Paul did not turn away from his mission uh, because he says he, he is constrained by the Holy Spirit. It's all part of God's plan, part of his purpose uh, that we know as uh, we read back onto the situation, part of a purpose that would take Paul to Rome, to take his proclamation of the gospel to Rome. Well, Paul had celebrated Passover in Philippi. He, he wanted to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Uh, the journey was not a quick one. The connections were not fast. He had to wait a uh, number of days in certain places for connecting uh, uh, vessels. He, he didn't want to be delayed. So instead of visiting Ephesus, when they landed in Mytilene, where he had to wait about a week for the next ship, Paul sent messengers to bring the elders from Ephesus. It was about a three to four day round trip. <clears throat> Paul would then have the opportunity to say the last words to them that he would ever say face to face. What would he say to them? What, what would be the most important things to say under those circumstances? Speaking to the, the elders of a church in what was a dark city, a city that had been long under the influence of the occult, where the gospel had taken root to the extent that it upset the local trade in in idols and caused an uproar. If you were poor, what would you say to them? What would be the thing that would be foremost on your heart and mind? What would be most important? Well, I want to focus this morning on the commands in Paul's speech. I think that gets to the heart of it. There, there are two commands, two imperatives. Uh, one command has two parts to it. Uh, and then there is a, a divine imperative in Paul's speech. Uh, uh, it, it is necessary, he says. So, so we're going to look at the four things Paul tells them they must do as elders, as leaders of the church. These are, these are the four things you must do. And I trust as we do that this morning, it won't just be a, a message for elders or for leaders or for teachers, for those who lead a, a ministry, but it'll be a message for each one of us. So let's have a look at what is Paul's greatest concern? What, what comes out of his love for these people and his love for the, uh, for the Lord Jesus? Well, Paul says firstly in verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he has obtained with his own blood. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. 
uh, that these words are very similar to what Paul will later write to Timothy from his first imprisonment in Rome uh, when Timothy is actually pastoring this church at Ephesus. Uh, Paul will write to him in 1 Timothy 4, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. He said to Timothy, Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. To the elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Well, well what do we learn here? To shepherd Jesus' blood-bought people, the pastor or, or elder, as a first priority, Paul says, must pay attention to his own heart, to his own walk with Jesus. The things of Christ must not be dealt with professionally, they must be dealt with personally. And friends, this isn't just a word for the pastor or the elder it speaks to community group leaders, it speaks to Sunday school teachers, to board members, to ministry leaders. It speaks to every member of the congregation. We must pay attention to our hearts. We must pay attention to our walk with Jesus. Uh, and the question this morning is, are you? Are you? Being an effective pastor or elder or community group leader or Sunday school teacher uh, or whatever else does not begin with the preparation for the sermon or for the pastoral visit or for the lesson that you're teaching. Uh, it, it begins in the quiet place of your own heart where you engage with Jesus on a personal level. And so we, we are to engage with Christ, not, not intermittently, not in some abstract way, uh, thinking that he's just there, not, not relating to him as some sort of benevolent force, but, but personally relating to him dwell, by dwelling on his word relating to him in prayer, speaking to him, holding on to faith and a good conscience, as Paul will later say to Timothy. Keep a close watch, Paul says to the elders, on yourself. In his last letter to Timothy, as he's awaiting execution from his second imprisonment in Rome, Paul writes, But as for you, for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God, that, that is you, Timothy, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Then, after having, having said that, then... Paul says to Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 2, preach. Then after that, Timothy, preach, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Do you see the order there? Timothy, let the word of God do its work in you then. Then minister to others. Elders, pay close attention to yourselves. Then minister to others. 
community group leaders, teachers, feed your own soul then. Invest in others. Our first and greatest responsibility, you see, is to guard our own relationship with the Lord. To nurture and cultivate our own hearts in the presence of the Lord Jesus. The Puritan preacher Richard Baxter wrote back in the, the 17th century, take heed to yourselves, lest your example contradict your doctrine, Let, lest you unsay with your lives what you say with your tongues. Take heed to yourselves. Friends, how are you going with that? It's a struggle, isn't it? You see, Satan wants to keep you so busy, so distracted, uh, so downcast that the life of Christ no longer freely, freely flows through your veins, but the life of Christ seems to be on drip feed. And your spiritual growth is impaired. You might get Bible knowledge but you're not growing in vital relationship with Jesus. And elders, teachers, leaders, remember this, that congregations usually don't grow to any greater maturity than their leaders do. So, so let that spur you on. Let, let that encourage you. Let, let that be an impetus in your own relationship with Jesus, in nurturing that. Paul says also, pay careful attention to the flock. Not just to some of the flock, but to all the flock. Shepherds care for the flock. They, they, they feed the sheep, they nourish, they love, they protect. And Paul, you see, in the years he spent with them, has set an example of how they are to go about that. Paul says to them, I ministered in humility. I didn't make myself central in my ministry, but it was Jesus who was central. And Paul was connected closely with them in personal relationship and compassion. He says he ministered with tears. And he was not afraid to endure hardship. Paul's ministry was also comprehensive. It was night and day to Jew and Greek in public space and from house to house. He fearlessly declared God's word. He preached Jesus and his saving work and the need for repentance and for faith. And he says, I did not shrink back from anything that was profitable. Paul worked hard in his ministry and he did not allow himself to become a burden on anyone. He did it sacrificially and he did it unselfishly not for gain. What was Paul's motivation? What kept him going? Well, we read in verse 28. He says to the elders, you had to care for the church of God, which he, Jesus, obtained with his own blood. That was Paul's motive, and that is to be the elders' motive. They, they are to be, the flock are to be precious to the leaders of the church. To the elders, to the ministry leaders, to the community group leaders, to the Sunday school teachers, and to, to, to everyone who serves in any way. Because they are precious to Jesus. And he has given the leaders, especially the elders, a charge, a responsibility to care 
for the flock. Not just to help them out in times of trouble, but to shepherd them from day to day in the situations of life, to nurture their souls, to point them to Jesus, to help them to know him more, to trust him more in their personal relationship with him so that they are growing and maturing. But it's not just the leaders either who have a responsibility for the maturity of the body of Christ. We all we all have a responsibility to build one another up to reach maturity in Christ. And so Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 16, each part is working properly that makes, it is each part working properly that makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You see, each of us, every one of us have a part to play. God has given gifts to us to use for the sake of other believers. Uh, and God has given us tasks of service to do. And our motive, our motive is our love for the person in the next row. It's, it's our love for the person sitting across the other side of the room. Uh, it, it's our love for the the person you chat to most Sunday mornings. It's, it's your love for the person you haven't even introduced yourself to yet. They, they are the family that Christ has given you and, and with it comes a, com a responsibility and a commitment to, to love them and to seek their good because, you see, that's at the heart of family life. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And friends, in this matter of our love for one another, our attitude to others in the church reveals to us the state of our own hearts, doesn't it? John wrote, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. You see, we, we identify our own new life in Christ in us, the reality of it, in the love that we find there for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the love given us by the Holy Spirit. In the long run, you see, it's not possible to belong to Jesus and have no driving desire, no inner urge to be with his family and to seek their good. We might put it this way, you, you can't love Christ, you can't claim to love him and to be indifferent to his bride. Listen again to Richard Baxter. He, he says, oh then, let us hear these arguments of Christ whenever we feel ourselves grow dull and careless. Did I die for them? And wilt thou not look after them? Were they worth my blood, and are they not worth thy labour? Did I come down from heaven to earth to seek and save that which was lost, and wilt thou not go to the next door or street or village to seek them? Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation, and was I willing to make thee a co-worker with me? And wilt thou refuse that little that lieth upon thy hands? Friends, it's not always easy to love our fellow believers. There will be those we just don't warm to. There, there, there will be those that even get on our nerves. Yet, yet we are still, to still love them 
And, and it's not an impossible task because, you see, the grace of God is big enough for that. As those who've received grace, we are daily filled with grace and so we, we give grace to others. And yes, in the grace that Christ gives us, we also love those when less likely to naturally love. And the new life that we have in Christ and his glory as our Saviour is expressed no more clearly than in our love for each other. And you see, friends, to not love your brothers and sisters in Christ is to resist the Holy Spirit who has joined us together in unity and bonds of love. Next, Paul says in verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And that from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things and to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Be alert. Be alert. Be awake. Be on your guard. Paul, you see, says he knows false wolves are, will come in among them. The fierce wolves will come in among them. I don't know if he has a special revelation from the Lord or, or if it's just the inevitability of satanic opposition. Whatever the case, danger lies ahead and Paul knows it. You see, wolves are the natural enemies of sheep. Wolves are predators and sheep are consumables. They devour sheep in satisfaction of their own base desires, their own base needs. Paul identifies two kinds of wolves here. There are those that come from outside the church. Uh, possibly he's just speaking about the opposition of people who seek to devour the church, to close it down. Maybe... He's speaking about false teachers on that Christian TV channel. Or in Paul's context, the itinerant preachers of his day who come with some kind of gospel. Eckhard Schnabel, in his commentary, thinks they are teachers with their own brand of theological and ethical emphasis. Teachers who pursue their own ends regardless of what becomes of the church. But they're not the only kind of wolves. The wolves that come from outside, there, there, are, there are others who are harder to recognise. They don't come from the outside snarling and snapping and contradicting, but they come from within with a, with a smile and a handshake. The, these wolves are the familiar faces. But they are just as dangerous and perhaps they are more dangerous because, you see, we're slower to recognise them as wolves. They arise, Paul says, from within the church. And I wonder if in saying this, Paul is even indicating that some of those elders standing with him at Mytilene, some of them would become wolves, be revealed as wolves. How do we know them? Well, Paul says in verse 30, they will speak twisted things, things that sound like truth, things that are close to truth, but there's something just a bit off. And they will draw away disciples after 
them. And maybe, maybe that makes them a little more obvious. You will know them because they gather a personal following. And the result of their work is division in the church. In contrast, you see, the spirit of Christ is a spirit of unity. And true ministers of Christ will, will minister humbly and sacrificially as they serve a crucified Lord, a crucified Saviour. As Peter wrote, Christ's shepherds will labour not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering, but being examples for the flock. They have the, the flock, the, the Jesus' little ones, the believers. They have their good at heart, not their own glory, not their own name, not their own following. And friends, sheep can tell the difference. So there's some hope. Sheep can tell the difference. Sheep can exercise discernment. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They know their master's voice. Friends, if you have been paying careful attention to yourself, to your own heart, to your walk, your walk with Jesus, you will know his voice. And you will know the voice of his under-shepherds. So friends, know your saviour and be discerning. Be discerning. Well, the last uh, imperative in Paul's speech to the elders is not a command, but what we know is a, a divine imperative. It's a necessity. It is necessary. Paul says in verse 35... In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must, the word is there in the Greek, it is a divine necessity that we help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul's first command was guard your own heart, guard your relationship with Jesus. Then he said guard the flock, guard against false teachers, guard against those who will cause division. Now Paul recognises that our, our faith and devotion to Christ is not only expressed in right doctrine and personal devotion, but it has a practical outworking as well. Paul says, we must help the weak because we are to do so as we remember the words of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Timothy Keller comments, the Apostle Paul viewed ministry to the poor as so important that it was one of the last things he admonished the Ephesian church to do before he left them for the last time. You don't use your last words without saying something that is all important to you. For Paul, it was don't only preach, help the poor. The reality is that the Christian faith is not merely a reciting of held beliefs. It must go deeper than that. James would have nothing of a faith that is simply rests in doctrine that is not lived. James says even demons believe but true faith, you see, is seen in action. It's seen in a changed life. It's seen in new behaviours. Uh, above all, it's seen in, in love for one another. The fruit of the Spirit are the behaviours that flow out, out of a, 
our new life in Christ as we grow in him. And love is the first fruit of the spirit. Love is behind helping the weak. Love is the primary mark of the character of Jesus, man or woman, from which all the other fruit of the Spirit have their source. So we might ask ourselves this morning, how are, are we loving? How are you loving? What arms and legs does your confession of faith have? Friends, may the Lord keep us from a faith expressed in words that is not lived. Well, Paul has set a high bar in this farewell speech to the elders at Ephesus. And we recognise it's not just for elders, but the implications for, uh, for each one of us. Uh, and so we ask, how, how can we do this? How, how can we live up to this? Where do we find the resources? Where will the Ephesian elders look for the resources? Well, Paul says to them in verse 32, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are being sanctified. I commend you to the word of God and his grace. If you don't think you have the ability to to live the kind of life, to do the kind of things that Paul is talking about here, then, then you're right. Whether you're an elder or, or, or whether you're just a member of the congregation, you're right. You don't have the ability, but it's the Lord who keeps you. It's the Lord who provides. It's the Lord who strengthens you. It's the Lord whose grace is sufficient for you. And friends, we, we need to recognise, though, that grace does not come uh, in some big tanker load that then lasts us through the rest of our lives on earth. Uh, grace doesn't come in the way that, you know, we put resources in our pockets and, and then uh, we look to them, we look to what's in our pocket and we feel self-assured about the future. No, that's not the way it works. God's grace comes to you every day as you need it for that day. And so, because it comes to us that way, our eyes are never taken off him. We're, we're never tempted to think, I have what I need now to do this. Tony Merida points out, Paul is reminding the elders that they don't shepherd alone. Jesus is with them and Jesus will build his church. But it's not just elders and other leaders who receive grace, is it? It's not just the elders who, who build up the body of the church, the body of Christ. They have a key role, but, but we all have a part. We all have a responsibility. The elders keep watch as, as under-shepherds over the flock and have a special responsibility to the risen Lord Jesus. But each of us plays our part in building that body up. And friends, the grace of God comes to us in Jesus Christ and it reconciles us, it unites us, it fills us with love for one another so that we seek the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. The grace of God comes to us so that we don't fail in our responsibility to urge each other on in faith and to warn against the deceptiveness of sin in our lives. 
the grace of God comes to us that urges us to speak uh, the word of Christ to one another as it dwells in us richly so that it flows out in, in speaking and singing as we proclaim the truth to one another. And friends, it's as we commit ourselves to serve each other using the gifts that God has given us that we collectively grow and, and we are built up into maturity in Christ, built up in love. Luke finishes this account telling us in verse 36, And when he had said these things, he knelt down, that is Paul, and prayed with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being most sorrowful of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. It was a tender moment. The Holy Spirit stirred their hearts in love. Uh, and there was this strong sense, I would imagine, of, of unity and purpose together. But how well did they listen to Paul? Well, Timothy became a pastor of the church at Ephesus in the years that followed. Uh, in the midst of that calling, Paul wrote to him from Rome and said, Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth. Why did Paul say that? Well, because people were despising him for his youth. What was going on? Timothy was, was the pastor of the church. He was following Paul's example in, in loving and nurturing believers, but he didn't have an easy time, at least with some. Apparently there were those who so belittled him uh, and spoke out against him that they caused him great anguish. And I wonder, were some of them among the elders? Eventually, the elders did not guard their hearts. Some 40 years later, the whole church is accused of having lost their first love. We read about it in Revelation 2 and verse 4. I think, I think it's because over time, the elders forgot Paul's word. Maybe they didn't pass it on to new elders who were appointed in the church. And you see, the elders lost their first love and they stopped nurturing the flock. Yes, they kept sound doctrine, but their hearts grew cold. Their elder, the elders stopped ministering Christ to the church in a way that meant the people of God were lost in wonder, love and praise. Friends, may the Lord help us all and especially those who lead and teach to pay careful attention to our own hearts, then to the flock, to remain alert to danger, to stay awake, and to help the weak. That, that is to live out the truth that we profess. And friends, let us remember what the first step is. Let us remember what the first priority is. Pay careful attention to yourselves. Pay careful attention to your own heart. Pay careful attention to your own relationship to the risen Lord Jesus. Let us pray.
Father, help us to learn from the words of Paul this morning, particularly his commands. Help us to remember that grace is not to be taken for granted, but it is, is experienced fresh every day. Help us, Lord, in humility, to come to Jesus every day. In humility of heart, seeking him, calling for his help, depending on him. Help us to pay careful attention to our own relationship with him, our own walk, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the body of Christ, for the, the sake of the flock. And Lord, having done that, Help us to minister well to others with the gifts you have given us that we might put them before ourselves. Help us to guard against those who would destroy the church. Give us the sermon. And Lord, give us the grace to help the weak, knowing it is better to give than to receive. And all of this, all of this comes from watching our own hearts, from paying heed to our own relationship with Jesus, that his life within might be abundant that we might grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And so the whole body of Christ grows. We pray that this might be true of us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to the close of our service, we're going to join together in praise singing together the song, O oh Great God. So 
We want to thank you again for joining with us this morning. We trust that uh, God has blessed this time of worship to each one of us. He's blessed his word to your hearts. Uh, we would love for you to get in touch with us, um, whether you're a, a regular member of the church or, or whether you're just visiting us online today. Uh, go to the Connect card, uh, virtual Connect card on the, the website or follow the YouTube uh, description link and we would love to hear from you. Now, let's turn our hearts to, to God's word for the benediction. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Amen. Yeah. 